In Australia, the start of probably the world's greatest offshore race is only hours away in Sydney. From the Opera House to the Outback for the next few days, the great race will take centre stage in this sport-obsessed country. This is home to possibly the remotest sailing club in Australia. It's been 20 years since they sent someone to the start line in Sydney, and recent history here has been anything but plain sailing. The Broken Hill Sailing Club was founded in 1962, with most of its members coming from the mining industry. For 40 years we have sailed here on Lake Menindee, but in 2002, with the start of the worst drought in Australian history, the lake has gone dry. I'm standing on the sand at the bottom of the boat ramp, and normally in this position, the water would be up to your chest, and the lake would stretch as far as the eye can see for 50 square miles, but not anymore. Isolation takes on a whole new meaning out here, and for these outback sailors, there's only one place to be on December the 26th. My name's Trevor Clare, I've got a farming property just back down the road a bit. Now, I used to crew for a bloke uh, in the Broken Hill Sailing Club out on Manini Lakes on a Flying Dutchman, and that was really great fun. This is final approach. So we've got ABN AMRO just above Wild Oaks. The greatest sailing adventure for anyone would have to be the Sydney to Hobart, be there on the start line, see all those boats heading off down to Hobart on December the 26th, and nothing better than that. Man against the water, against the elements, it's a good show. And we will have a Spinnaker Spectacular to start the Rolex Sydney Hobart for 2006. Last year's winner was the Super Maxi Wild Oats 11. They set a new race record of one day, 18 hours on their way to line honours and overall race victory. They've been installed as pre-race favourites, but in this, the toughest of offshore challenges, nothing can be taken for granted. On paper, you know, we are one of the fastest. It's Scandia and Maximus, you know, are both good boats that are the same size as us, that can do equally well, because it only takes one little equipment failure, a, a loose sheet on a jib, and they'll overtake you in a, a matter of, of an hour. So, you know, whilst on paper we might have the fastest boat speed, you know, in reality, when it comes to the race itself, it's, there's nothing in it. The Sydney Hobart is the ultimate test of any yacht and in this war of attrition it's about stamina as well as strategy. If you do have equipment failure sometimes the crew get a bit of bad morale, oh the other boats are in front but you know you know from experience that just be patient because the next radio schedule you'll probably see if you're suffering it you know and you're well prepared then chances are the other boats will be too. Recently arrived from Malta and the Rolex Middle Sea Race, ABN AMRO 1 has made the long journey south for its first ever Sydney Hobart. The Volvo 70 may not have the speed of the Super Maxis, but it takes much more than that to win this race. For me, 70 footers don't beat 100 footers, considering we're all Canton keel, high performance boats. So you know with the conditions that are being forecast, everyone's not going to get there. You just, that's just statistically the case. So, um, you know, we've just got to make sure we're not one of the ones that breaks down um, and that, that, you know, the longer we can stay in there racing at as close to 100%, the more chance we've got of being the first to Hobart. ABN AMRO 1 have enlisted the talents of Volvo veteran and Sydney Hobart specialist Chris Nicholson. His career has seen him sail all over the planet, but this event is something special. Of all the places in the world, Hobart is the best place to finish. Like, you know, you get to shore, you have some food, and you've usually had a pretty tough two or three days, like, guaranteed. And you get in the customs house and you have a good time with all your friends and, and see all the other boats come in. It, it is one of, the, it's one of the reasons why you do the race. This 628-mile offshore classic takes the fleet from the spectacular start line in Sydney Harbour down the New South Wales coast and across the infamous Bass Strait before heading for home and the triumphant finish in Hobart. 
The second of the Volvo 70s competing in this year's race is the former Brunel, modified and renamed Ichiban. Campaigned by owner Matt Allen, Ichiban are keen to exploit their reputation for durability, hoping predictions for a tough race hold true. Sort of high 30s apparent. The Volvo 70s are built to go around the world, so they are stronger and they do have more stability through the hull form than the maxi boat. So theoretically going to windward and heavy running and reaching conditions, they, they ought to be better, but we'll need a lot of wind to see that come through. Matt Allen has recruited Michael Coxon as his tactician. Over the years, Coxon has experienced everything this race can throw at a yacht and knows that if it gets nasty, it's the super maxis that will be watching the weather the most. The bigger boats tend to be a little close to the edge structurally, so if we get some bad conditions, three boats to break down is actually not that hard. So the next cab off the ranks would be ourselves and ABN, and uh, ABN's obviously a, the proven boat. It was the fastest boat around the world. So if the conditions are bad, I actually would not be surprised if one of the Volvos was first to Hobart. Behind every winning yacht is a dedicated designer. Don Jones is responsible for both Ichiban and 2003 winner Scandia. His loyalties may be divided, but if the predictions of tough conditions persist, it'll be better news for his 70-footer. In all likely conditions, the Super Maxis will get there before the Volvo 70s, but the Volvo 70s are particularly fast in fast reaching conditions. And if the weather conditions, like say very strong northeasterlies for over the whole course, then um, I think my money would go on the Volvo 70s to get there first. The race's reputation as a boat breaker is well deserved. It's a balancing act for the designer to ensure their yacht makes the trip swiftly, but above all, safely. I didn't design boats somewhere else and then come and find a Sydney Hobart race. This has been my experience. But yeah, you've got a duty of care, um, and that manifests itself in the fact that I don't enjoy this time of the year when the boats at sea. I don't sleep too well. The morning of the race, a time to discuss last-minute strategy and plans and for a final look at what the weather may bring. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this briefing for the uh, 62nd Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. Earlier forecasts of a brutal and testing time ahead for the fleet are being downgraded. A 30-knot southerly buster, an area of intense low pressure, had been predicted for the race start. But it's something that uh, we've been watching, but we're hopeful now that it's, it's a pretty mobile system and we'll move away. It may be the day after Christmas, but it's anything but relaxed down at the dockside of the CYCA. Most of the teams have worked throughout the holiday period to get their boats to the start line in racing trim. While the faster yachts will expect to be in Hobart in a little over 48 hours, the smaller boats could be at sea for five days or even longer, so nothing is left to chance. A year of waiting is almost over, as all eyes are on the most famous start line in sailing. In Melbourne, even the cricket test match stops for an early lunch, so no one misses out. At 1pm, the great race will be on. It's always an amazing start, I find. I mean, 400,000 people watching live, you know, you don't get that in any other sport anywhere else in the world. Go, Jim, on! 78 boats fire off the line as Offshore Racing's Blue Ribbon event gets underway. The bottom end of the line was going to be favoured. Of course, everyone had the same strategy. We were down the bottom with the Oats and uh, AB and AMRO, and uh, it was pretty tight tussle down the bottom there. The start was for us fantastic. We got the position we wanted at the start and um, sort of got in the box there to control Scandia. Wild Oats wins the race to the first mark, reaching it in just under seven minutes. Behind, ABN AMRO 1 is pushing hard. Hot on the heels of New Zealand Super Maxi Maximus. 
the fleet make their way out past Sydney's famous South Heads. For the thousands of spectators lining the shore, a grandstand view of a sailing spectacular. To get out of the heads is always a fantastic effort, but we also set a new record for you know, exiting Sydney Harbour too, so it was a lot of fun. Out of the shelter of the harbour, the fleet gets a taste of the power of the Tasman Sea for the first time. A big swell and a strong southeasterly promise a far from comfortable ride to Hobart. Will the Volvo 70s get the tough upwind conditions that could help them overhaul the Supermaxes? Or can Wild Oats stretch her early lead? Joining Scandia and Wild Oats as the third Super Maxi in this year's event is Maximus. Winners of the 2005 Rolex Fastnet race and Transatlantic Challenge, they've set their sights on completing a unique treble by taking line honours in this year's Sydney Hobart. We built the boat to try and win this race. It's, uh, it's a maximum length overall that the race allows, so it's the same as the other two super maxis that are competing in this race so theoretically we should have at least as good a chance as, as the other two super maxis in the 2005 maxi worlds maximus suffered catastrophic mast failure illustrating the enormous stresses these high performance yachts work under thankfully no one was injured in the collapse and this year, New Zealand's sole entry is determined to go flat out for victory. For us, the ultimate would be to get um, a win, line on us win, at least in this, uh, in this particular Sydney Hobart race. But, uh, you know, I think we'll do New Zealand as good a job as we can. We're proud Kiwis and we've got a great boat. The Sydney Hobart, though, is about so much more than just being first across the line. Britain's Michelle Colenso was halfway through a circumnavigation of the globe when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Despite undergoing surgery and chemotherapy, she was determined to sail in the race on her yacht Capricio of Rue in the cruising division. There's a huge opportunity here to get awareness for breast cancer and that people need to talk about it, need to be aware of it, need to know about um, what to do. And I just said, well, let's give it a go. If we can pass the race requirements, we can get awareness out there. <laughs> so I've been so focused on getting a message out, I haven't really had time to think about the race, and I suddenly realised, oh God, this is really serious, this is a really big deal. And I thought, oh, I wonder who we're going to be all right. But one of the other boats, um, we said if there's no wind in the Bass Strait, they'll be slow as well, we'll raft up with them and we'll get a couple of bottles of bubbly out and have a bit of a laugh. We're not expecting to be the first over the line, that's for sure. It's a few hours into the race, and the leaders are powering their way down the New South Wales coast. The three of us were just tacking down the coast, just staying out of the worst of the bump. Uh, it's quite rough, you know, two and a half, three knots of current against 25 knots of wind, you know, you get some pretty short, steep seas, and we knew it was safer to just keep nursing the boat along. It's uh, five o'clock in the uh, first afternoon and we're doing about 12, 13 knots through the water. Abbey and Emro, just uh, a beam of us out here. Maxis are just uh, down to leeward and, and ahead of us. But uh, it doesn't look like a fast race at this point in time, but uh, we'll see what's ahead tonight. ABN AMRO 1 head the furthest east, away from the shore to find the extra speed from the current. Out here, it's faster, but harder too. Once it started to get really rough, you know, the ABN and those guys started to pull us in a bit. We were, you know, not concerned about the boat, but we just wanted to make sure we got through the night, so we opted to, you know, stay in shore, and ABN went out to the current where the waves were a lot bigger and harder, and, and um, you know, we just thought, we'll let them have it. Wild Oats have led from the gun, but as the fleet head into the first night, ABN begin to close the gap, 
benefiting from the stronger winds and current further offshore. Maximus is up with the leaders closer to land, and then soon after three in the morning. We're checking the bearing on Maximus. That's okay, we're gaining bearing on them. Back to wild oats, we're still gaining. Where's Maximus? We can't see them, you know. We thought, oh no. Once again, Maximus have suffered a dramatic dismasting. A mast fitting failure sends the mast crashing down in the darkness, causing injuries to six crew members. Thankfully, none life threatening. The race's unparalleled safety procedures swing into action, with the most seriously injured crewmen airlifted to safety as soon as daylight comes. Despite tens of thousands of offshore miles without incident, ABN also suffer from a dismasting. Fortunately, no significant injuries, but like Maximus, their race is over. It was blown between sort of 30 to 35 knots, but we were very comfortable, as comfortable as you can be in that stuff. And um, next minute there were two very loud bangs and uh, the whole lot's over the side, and uh, that was it, our race is done. ABN begin the slow journey back to Sydney, limping into Ulladulla, 230 kilometres from the race start. They took a calculated risk to go where the supermaxes were afraid to, but it hasn't paid off this time. We had the choice to either go into shore and take less breeze and less waves, or to sort of tough it out a bit wider in more current, more waves, more wind, and, and we, chose, we chose the latter because we, we thought it would be the fastest way to Hobart and um, of course it was bumpy and it wasn't very pleasant but we were, you know, it was basically propelling us into the lead so it was worth the chance. Ahead of the fleet lies the island of Tasmania, the smallest of Australia's six states. It's renowned for its natural and unspoiled beauty. From the majestic Mount Wellington to Hobart, Australia's second oldest city. The Sydney Hobart remains Tasmania's defining event. 24 hours into the race, and the lead is still with wild oats. When we first entered Bastro, it was pretty rough, big seas, and you know, we were actually preparing ourselves, hey, this is going to be really tough to get across in one piece. But chasing down the leader is Scandia. So we're just mindful of wild oats all the time. We're only two miles behind them. We just put the throttle hard down to the floor and it was really good for us. We were just zooming along 17 knots. Scandia's challenge has seen them close the gap to wild oats all the way across Bass Strait. But just before 2 p.m. on day two, it all changes when suddenly... Bang! The, uh canard snapped clean off at the bottom of the hull obviously as soon as that went we just started going sideways you know because we've got our keel canted at 40 degrees and the canard's the only thing that uh, keeps us going in a straight line so we're now going sideways and you know it's head in your hand stuff you know you just think oh you know what have we done to deserve this and with scandia struggling wild oats look unstoppable once Scandia broke the you know, front canard, we knew that it was an upwind beat the whole way to Tasman Light and there's no way they're going to catch us once they'd lost that piece of equipment. So uh, it was bad luck for Scandia, but that's just yachting, I guess. As Wild Oats pull away, Ichiban closes in on Scandia and second place. The tough conditions have taken their toll further down the fleet with the crew of Ray White Kumalu, winners of the 1968 race, forced to abandon ship off Eden. And British yacht Adventure comes to their rescue. As the fleet make their way down the Tasmanian coast, their arrival is eagerly awaited by not just sailing fans. Fish, and specifically oysters, have become one of Tasmania's most popular exports over the last few years. And in a few days, they'll be very much in demand. With the uh, arrival of the Rolex Sydney, the Hobart fleet, it's a very busy time of the year. All the tourists and sailors that have made their way south, um, all the celebrations that are going on, it's literally a time where we need to double our production to accommodate all those celebratory parties at this time of the year. 
the taste of our oyster is so unique. It's a reflection on the, the quality of the water that we have here in the state and the effort that we've, we've put into making sure that when we do produce an oyster, it's literally the best oyster in the world. After two days and 600 nautical miles, Wild Oats prepare to turn yachting's most famous corner as they round Tasman Island and head up the Derwent River to Hobart. There's something about coming up the Derwent with that crowd and just it's a very special finish of a yacht race. It is one of the uh, Everest of yachting really and it's um, just a, a great event and to come out on top in tough conditions for any team is a very satisfying feeling and you know, we're just very happy to be part of it. It's back-to-back -back line honours wins for Bob Oatley's Wild Oats, the first time in over 40 years. Ichiban take advantage of Scandia's problems, pushing them into third and claiming second spot. I think the Rolex in the Hobart yacht race is just an enormous adventure. I mean, their highs, their lows, you know, the starts, sensational. The finish is great. Waiting dockside, Don Jones to welcome home the first of his two charges, both of whom survived where others failed. The sense of achievement for finishing this race is really what it's all about. That's why everybody keeps coming back here, because you know, we call it the great race. For us, it really is such a special time down here in Hobart. You know, it's tough stuff. You're out there battling the elements and, uh, you know, working your best as a team to, uh, you know, reach a common goal. Over the next three days, Hobart welcomes the rest of the fleet into its historic waterfront. And the overall winner on handicap, Love and War, their third Tattersall's Cup victory, 32 years after their first triumph. So there's a lot of people have done this, some of them 40 years or more, and have not won overall. So it's a really, really tough one to win. You've got to savour them when they come along. There can be few better places to finish a yacht race than Hobart. And as always, every finisher receives as warm a welcome as the Line Honours winner. In total, 69 of the 78 starters complete this gruelling course. But perhaps the person who most typifies the spirit of the race is Michelle Colenso. Not only has she completed one of offshore racing's greatest challenges, she's also won her cruising division. And as another dramatic Rolex Sydney Hobart comes to an end, the outback sailors from Broken Hill are already looking forward to the next great race. And hopefully, a little rain too. <laughs>